It'd be a fear of spiders, fear of snakes, fear of heights. That was the first one I ever worked on, um, which was quite awkward for an architect not being able to go up a ladder because of a fear of heights. But I got rid of it in about ten minutes. So once you've chosen that, on a scale of zero to ten, where ten is the worst that it possibly could be, and zero is it completely clear, completely gone. Right now, when you think about that, what is the number that comes to mind? Whatever that first number is, just make a note of it, write it down. It will be the first one. If you can't get a number, we often say to kids, imagine it's a ball. How big is the ball? Get, get, if you're more kinesthetic, that can be an easier way of working. So you, you start to think about the problem and you get a feeling for how big it is, like it's really big or actually about this big. It's just something that will give you a cue and a reference point when you come back to check in. Now, before we start, there is what's called a setup phrase. And everybody's going to have a different issue, a different problem, different memory they want to work on. So I'm going to give it the same title. And we're just going to call it this problem. And on the side of your hand, here, there is a point roughly where the crease is called, we call it the karate point. You know, anyone that's seen a kung fu movie or a kung fu expert, that's the point where they, they crack the brick. And what I invite you to do is just take two or three fingers and just begin tapping continuously on the side of there. And repeat after me, even though I have this problem, I completely and profoundly accept myself. And we do that three times. Even though I have this problem, I completely and profoundly accept myself. Even though I have this problem, I completely and profoundly accept myself. So that's the first point that we tap on. Then we just shorten the phrase down to this problem and begin tapping the sequence that's shown on the screen here. So the first point is begin tapping on the crown of the head and repeat to yourself this problem. Tap five or six times. And just here at the corners of at the start of your eyebrows, again, tap with your fingers, repeating to yourself, keep your attention on this problem. Then move to the side of your eyes, to the corners here on the bone. Um, tap five or six times there, repeat to yourself this problem. And then directly under the eyeball, on the bone here, repeat to yourself this problem. Then under the nose, just above the lip, this problem. Then on the chin, in the hollow of the chin, five or six times there, this problem. Now, if you trace your collarbones across, they come over and they loop down like this. And there's a hollow just in here on both sides. So tap in those hollows, they're just about here, repeating to yourself this problem. And then about four inches under your arm, or about 10 centimeters for the European colleagues. Um, if you put your hand into your under your arm and press with your little finger, you will feel a kind of a little sore spot in there. That's the point to tap on. And just tap in there for this problem five or six times. And then bring back to the karate point and tap five or six times this problem. Okay. Now I'm going to repeat it again, but we're going to do it a bit faster. So crown of the head, this problem. Eyebrows, this problem. Corner of the eyes, this problem. Under your eyes, this problem. Under the nose, this problem. On the chin, this problem. Those collarbone hollows, this problem, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter if you're not exactly on the spot, the intention is what matters. Intention is very important. And then under the arm, 
this problem. And then finally back to the Crowley point, this problem. Okay, and just take a deep breath while you do that. What we're going to do then is check in. When you think about the problem now, what is the number that comes to mind? Has the number changed? Has it decreased? Has the thought changed? Um, has the emotion changed? Just notice what's happened. Okay. Now for some people it will have collapsed down to zero. Some people might have a seven and it's gone down to a four. Some people might have a five, it's gone down to four, three, one. There may be a bit left there or it may have changed. So what we're going to do is repeat the sequence again, but we're going to change the setup phrase. And this time we're going to start with on the side of the hand here. And you see it on screen. Even though I still have the rest of this problem, I deeply and profoundly accept myself. Again, even though I still have the rest of this problem, I deeply and profoundly accept myself. Even though I still have the rest of this problem, I deeply and profoundly accept myself. And we're going to use the rest of this problem as a reminder phrase. So I'm going to go back to the sequence again. So starting with the crown of the head, the rest of this problem. Eyebrows, the rest of this problem. Corner of the eyes, the rest of this problem. Under the eyes, the rest of this problem. Under the nose, the rest of this problem. Under the chin, the rest of this problem. Those hollows and the collarbones, the rest of this problem. And under the arms, and you can do left side or right side, it doesn't matter. The rest of this problem. And then back to the karate point. The rest of this problem. Okay, and again, check in and see on a scale of 0 to 10, when you think about the original problem, where is it now? What has the number changed to? How has it changed? Have the thoughts and memories changed? Very often what you find with this is that it will collapse quickly for some people, collapse slowly for others. But also sometimes the memory changes. Now people often are worried saying, oh, will I, will I lose my memories if I start doing this? No. What happens is that the emotional component of the memory changes because the emotion sits on the memory like a filter and it distorts the perception of what actually happened. So what often happens is, especially with traumatic memories, is that the memories become sharper, they become clearer. Um, people become great witnesses in legal cases because they can talk a bit more dispassionately but more accurately about what actually happened in, in especially in cases of abuse and trauma. Um, it's proved to be very, very effective. In fact, it's proven to be so effective that in some legal cases they, they won't let the person collapse the emotion down to zero because it looks like they don't care about the case anymore. You know, they're not as emotionally involved. Uh, so solicitors like people to be emotional when they're in court. So, in the text box, in the chat box on the right hand side, if anybody has any particular experiences that they want to share, um, even if it's just the number, if you want to type in the number, what it was before, what it's changed to, uh, please go ahead and do so. I'd be very curious to see how you found that. So, what actually happened? Well, the traditional fear response model says that, you know, there's a stimulus and then the stimulus causes a response in the viewer. So when you have a stimulus, like the snake, it causes the appropriate emotional response. That's fine, but I don't have a problem with snakes. So why does it affect you but not me? Because surely this should be a universal problem. It goes back to the question of what we are. In the 17th century, with the emergence of the Enlightenment movement, scientists started to question the nature of reality the nature of God. Science became the new religion as such. 
um, in that it was challenging a lot of the what were perceived to be the superstitions of religion. And scientists like Sir Isaac Newton were interested in breaking down the world around them into systems because they figured that if you could break down the human being into their component systems, such as the skeletal system, which is your structural support system, your cardiovascular system, that's your, your, your piping and your plumbing, your neurological system, that's your electrical wiring, um, your lymphatic system, that's like your drainage system in the body, and then the viscera, that's like the, the skin, the, the walls of your house. Um, you might notice the architectural references there, yeah, apologies for that. But the point was, they figured that if you could figure out how all the components worked, we would be able to understand the human machine. You know, we, we could take God out of the machine and such. But at the beginning of the last century, Einstein and others came along and said, well, you know, it's not that straightforward. You know, we're much more than machines. Einstein's famous equation, E equals MC squared, has one fundamental truth to it, which is that everything is energy, and energy is all there is. It's all there is. I mean, there is mass, there is gases, there are liquids, but they're all made of energy. And what we've discovered over the last couple of years is that rather than just simply being a collection of systems, we are actually energetic beings that have a physical form. We have a biofield referred to as the human biofield. We can photograph it. We can measure it. Let me just see, can I get a pointer up here? And you know, we can photograph it here. These are Kirlian photo photographs taken by bombarding um, a photographic plate with electrons and then photographing and then processing the image. And these amazing, uh, I won't say auras because these are different to auras, these are electromagnetic uh, fields that, that we find around living things.